Hello and welcome to another Late Night Talk. My guest this evening is Christopher Rocchio. He's the author of the Sun Eater series. I read the first two books, Empire of Silence and Howling Dark. And you can see book three is right up there. <laughs> Demon in White to read very, very soon. So we're going to talk about the series, but we'll talk a little bit about how he got where he is today, because the journey of every person's path to publication is completely different. So uh, thanks for joining us, Christopher. And um, tell me a little bit about your background. What kind of stuff were you reading as a kid in, in speculative fiction and genre and sci-fi and fantasy? Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Uh, and I guess, you know, uh, I, I like to say that I'm like the youngest person who could have read Harry Potter when it comes out. I think the first one came out when I was four. And I was reading sort of above my sort of above my age group. So I read it when it came out. I don't know that I processed all of it. You know, I don't, you know, memory from that is kind of fuzzy. But I remember reading the third one, like in first grade, which is, I think, age six. Uh, and so I was I was I remember being bullied by kids who like now make pilgrimages to Hogsmeade now that I've like, <laughs> long, since, long since moved on from Harry Potter. Right. They're like, oh, man, I got my wand. And I'm like, that's cool. I remember when you like, uh, you know, shoved me in a locker for reading it. That's <laughs> um but I, <laughs> I moved on uh, from that pretty quick. I, uh, you know, the Lord of the Rings films were coming out, uh, you know, right around 2000. And so they were sort of everywhere and unavoidable. And I, you know, like I was always a little bit of a bookish kid. I liked Star Wars. Uh, you know, my parents did not let me watch a lot of television, but they let me watch things they were familiar with, which meant mm. basically I could watch like reruns of like the Andy Griffith show and like Batman and I could watch the Star Wars movies. Uh, <laughs> and so I did and I watched them sort of incessantly. Uh, so I had this like science fiction as visual media thing going, and then I read Lord of the Rings, and my parents got me the audiobook because I, you know, read The Hobbit fine, but Lord of the Rings is a little above my like, you know, mm. kid reading level. Um, but the audiobook sort of helped crack that for me. So I, um, and they were the only ones I owned because I had the CDs, right? So I would finish them, and then I would go back and I would just listen to them again and again and again, and I, I ended up basically wearing the CD out. Uh, you know, the box is all falling to pieces and the CDs were skipping tracks and things by the end. It was, <laughs> it was a mess. Um, and uh, so I, you know, I, I, I say often it, with all seriousness, I've probably read Lord of the Rings read, you know, like 80 times because mm -hmm. I, I went through it just incessantly. And so that and and the Star Wars sort of shaped my really early reading. Um, and then I think around uh, the end of middle school, uh, which uh, I, I don't know. I know the education system is different, you know, in, yeah. in the UK, but uh, that's like age 12 ish, yeah, uh, yeah. 13. I, um, I, I read Dune. Uh, a friend of mine had like seen the, uh, the David Lynch movie and uh, mentioned the book and I looked it up and I was like, Oh, this sounds amazing. There's that Arthur Clark blurb where he compares it to Lord of the Rings. It's like, Oh, perfect. Right. Mm -hmm. And it turned out to be like right in the middle of those two branches. Right. It was like somewhere between, you know, uh, Lord of the Rings, right, and, and and Star Wars in certain ways in terms of like you know the the way the story is structured and obviously it's got a lot uh, superficially in common with Star Wars, uh, you know, uh, what with the the space opera and the and you know the sort of you know space wizards, but not really kind of thing. Yeah, going on, right? yeah. Uh, and so that was really formative. And the, but what really what really uh, got me got me really going as a reader um as, as like a young adult was i uh, i went to what we call magnet school uh for high school here in the u.s and that's it's public school but it's like got a bunch of extra funding tacked on so they can offer a lot more classes i think they offered like 11 different languages you could take usually in the u.s it's like probably spanish right but uh but this one had a bunch so i um but they also taught a, a science fiction literature class that i took uh in high school Wow. And the guy who taught that was uh, an old school, like capital F fan, like, you know, annual world con attendee kind of guy. Right. And so, um, you know, usually people ask me, like, who are my favorite science fiction writers? I'm like two generations out of phase because I, <laughs> you know, I had to read not just like, you know, Asimov, Clark Heinlein, but we had to read like Ben Vogt and like Zelazny and Lee Brackett and C.L. Moore and like all of these these writers from, you know, like the fifties and earlier, even sometimes, right. Uh, or, or like the new wave writers, obviously, mm. we, you know, talked about Frank Herbert stuff in that class too. Uh, and uh, so that was a really, really uh, sort of uh, sort of formative thing for me uh, just as a reader. And then sort of the last bit of spin on it is after uh, when well, my last year of college, I started to intern for Bain books um, and cause they happened to be located in, uh, in my town. And uh, which they're the only sort of, you know, mid to major science fiction publisher that's not in New York City. So that was like a weird yeah. sort of cosmic coincidence. And I ended up working for them for seven years. But as a part of that, I had access to, you know, all their spare stock. And they just had stuff going back to 84. And 
uh, as an intern, they're like, well, we're not paying you, so you can have as many books as you want. Uh, which you know, when you're when you're getting paid in college credit, and you know, the, the books are the books are nice. Um, so I ended up reading a bunch of sort of their back catalog, right? So a lot of you know, like the '80s military SF writers, uh, David Drake, uh, Larry Niven, Jerry Purnell, a lot of those guys. Mm -hmm. um, and I got to work with a bunch of them too, uh, which was cool, you know, because um, they they published David Weber, they published Lois, Lois Bujold, who is mm -hmm. I, I just adore Lois Bujold. She's an absolute genius. Um, and, uh, you know, so I got to work with them too, but that was sort of the, sort of the last little bit of spin on my trajectory, I think, um, uh, as a reader, um, and, uh, all of these things, of course, you know, like writers like to pretend that they uh, are not influenced by the things that they read, uh, sometimes, but like, you know, I've always tried to be pretty straightforward about that. Those are yeah. sort of all the elements. Um, and yeah, that's, that's sort of the story. Did, cause, cause when I talk to younger writers, there's a, a a bit of an age gap between me and you and some of the other, other generations they talk start talking i think you know games influence them comics tv as much as books and you know and old school comics when i was a kid but have did any of that stuff influence you because when i was a kid it was like end of the era on the repeats of incredible hulk and you know original Battlestar galactica and all that kind of thing Oh, totally. Yeah, no, I, uh, you know, mentioned Star Wars, obviously, and there's, yeah. you know, there's a literary component to that, too. But, uh, but the, you know, the original films, my, my father owned a Laserdisc player. So growing up, I could actually watch the, you know, the unlucased versions of the of the original trilogy. So I was, <laughs> uh, I was uh, sort of a Star Wars purist, whether I wanted to be or not early on, right? Um, I thought the prequels were okay, because I was, you know, young enough to think they were awesome. Mm. Uh, but, um, but as far as like other media, sure, you know, I, uh, 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 have been like a lifelong Nintendo fan, right? So there's mm. uh, there's a lot of uh, video game influence. Um, you know, maybe some of the mainline stuff, but I, I liked a lot of um, uh, like Japanese RPGs. I've never been a Final Fantasy guy, but um, uh, games like Tales of Symphonia, like Bad Kaitos, uh, there's a game for the Xbox 360 called Lost Odyssey. Uh, it's actually written mostly by a Japanese novelist whose name escapes me. Um, and, uh, it, it, and that was just a wonderful, wonderful story. And, you know, the... Uh, I, I'm not prejudicial about, you know, what medium the story comes from, you know, a good story yeah. is a good story. You know, there are a lot of people, you know, from generations, you know, like my, you know, like my, my college, you know, professors, one didn't like science fiction, but if they did, they were not, you know, on board with video games and, you know, or whatever. Right. And that has, uh, that has never been me. Um, I uh, used to be a huge Doctor Who fan. Uh, mm -hmm. It sort of fell off qualitatively uh, and I, uh, I had to go find other things, but that was a, that was a huge thing too, for me. Uh, you know, so there's some TV stuff. I was never a big uh, Battlestar Galactica guy, but I love Stargate, mm -hmm. uh, you know? Um, no, I was actually just rewatching that. Uh, I got derailed by the birth of my daughter. Uh, so the, uh, the marathoning of uh, SG one had to stop, <laughs> but, uh, but I've been, uh, you know, but yeah, no, uh, totally. Uh, you know, I will echo the younger writers on that. Um, manga has also been a bit of an influence as well. Um, not so much, uh, you know, American comics. I love Batman, but that's, I was never really a big superhero guy, which is funny because I, I, I've written, I've written a Thor story for Marvel comics. But, I saw uh, that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, that was, uh, that was, uh, sort of, a that just sort of happened. Um, you know, but you know, I, you know, like I said to, uh, uh, to them at times, hey, you know, Thor, you know, wasn't originally a superhero, so it's all, you know, all right. Um, you know, well, so. it's, it, it ties into mythology, and there's a lot of mythology in your books, and the idea of, you know, reality of what a person is versus what people say about the person. So, yeah, there's, there's connective tissue. Yeah, you can, yeah. You can blag. It, it, all, it all worked <laughs> out. You know, that was like, that was like the right choice, right? Uh, they had me do an Iron Man pitch, too, and they were like, this one's terrible. We'll do the Thor one. And I'm like, great, okay, that's what I was hoping you would <laughs> That say. makes more sense. Uh, it's like, I'm not sure that I, I'm not sure that I'm the right guy for Iron Man. But um, but yeah. that was sort of a one-off thing. In any case, um, uh, I have friends with Steve McNiven, and uh, um, so that just sort of happened of itself. But um, but yeah, so comic books totally a bit of an influence, but that's mm. a little bit more peripheral. I think the video games after after literature probably video games are probably primary, uh, and then maybe cinema third, uh, if I had to guess. Yeah, some of the some of the storylines and are, are so good on some of the games now that I just you know I love the four. So weirdly, I don't write sci-fi. I never have, but I love a lot of sci-fi in other mediums and like the Fallout games and all of the Mass Effect oh, sure. games, and the stories are just so good, so so good. And yeah, so... I, I, yeah, I think I'm sort of the other way because I think that most of this, if I if I list all of my favorite things, it's mostly fantasy. But I've ended up writing science fiction. Mm. Uh, it's just you know, uh, it's funny, funny how that happens. Um, yeah. 
So yeah. when when did you first think I want to start writing? I want to have a go at doing a novel. Um, <laughs> this sounds this sounds fake maybe, but uh, this has been more or less the only thing I've ever wanted to do. Uh, I no, started. I, yeah. I, I I've had that yeah. since I was. 10 my dad was like that's nice but how about you get a real job first okay. yeah no exactly exactly <laughs> the same i I think i was in i think it was eight uh and i was like i'm gonna start writing these stories seriously i uh my uh with the intent of actually finishing you know but i had no idea how long a book was right you know when you're a kid you yep. you write on like 10 pages of loose leaf paper and you're like i'm done i've done it it's uh it's there you know yeah i can i can see the stack of paper uh <laughs> rising off the desk it's not flat anymore so i must have done it yeah um but I, uh, you know, I had a group of friends and we play make believe right uh, at recess after lunch at school. And uh, we started out just playing like they, they were Dragon Ball Z characters, but I didn't know what that was. So I was Batman. And, uh, you know, I would we would write down, you know, uh, our own sort of, you know, I guess we call it lore now. Right. Mm. But our own lore about what we were doing and the characters would mutate. And eventually they all, you know, grew up and developed social skills and an interest in sports. And I did not. Um, so I just kept writing and like, well, all those nerds are gone. So I'm going to just, you know, write my own shit. And, uh, uh, and I just kept doing that. So like my school notes were always, you know, notes on the right hand and then just nonsense on the left. And I was never paying attention seriously and always just working on, on something. And, um, I finished something that was actually book sized in, in like seventh or eighth grade, uh, it's terrible. There, there is one copy that still exists, um, and and, uh, and and it is an undisclosed location. Uh, but uh, I, I worked, you know, um, on it through high school and into college, and I never like stopped writing. Uh, you know, whatever nonsense I was writing as a, as an eight year old, and started writing Empire of Silence. Really, I just like would change a few elements and then try a new draft and just keep going. So I've been working on the same book for you know my had been working on the same book for basically my whole life um but wow. uh, it, it never at any real point became this thing there was a point in college where i'm like okay like this has got to be the one like i have a year and a half left uh this has got to be the one that works out because my goal was to be done by the time i graduated um which worked out uh, i don't you know that that's not a good plan by the way you know? <laughs> like, yeah um but i i did finish uh you know uh about I think a semester before I graduated. And so I spent the last semester in school trying to get an agent. Um, I got one about a month before I graduated and we, uh, that was in December, 2015. And we sold the book a month after I graduated. Uh, so that like worked out, uh, um, but uh, it usually doesn't. So I, I do not no, recommend that people. My story is the other way. I finished my first book when I was 19 and there, there's also one copy and it was terrible, but I was convinced <laughs> it would be so good and it would sell. And of course, fantasy is always serious. So I wrote the sequel in the trilogy and then went on to sell the first one. So they could say, oh, have you got any more? Yes, I've already got a book too. And of course it was summarily rejected by everybody because it was terrible. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's a really good plan if they buy book one, right? <laughs> then you look like a genius. Uh, you know, I, um, I know, I know a writer for whom that worked out. Uh, she had like three books done. Uh, and uh, the agent was like, oh, this book is amazing. Uh, and, do you have anything else? She's like, yes, this and this. And they're like, oh, perfect. And uh, mm -hmm. she's not a speculative fiction writer. So, you know, um, it, you know, it can a different work. industry, but like yeah. Adrian Tchaikovsky uh, with his. 10 book shadows of the app you know he had he handed in book one and they were like oh, i'm not quite sure have you, have you got any more and he's like yeah, here's book two and three and i'm halfway through four and they were like oh, oh okay uh, <laughs> let's bring yeah. back every six months now um all right so it can work out but it's it's not it's not often no yeah, I mean, he wasn't it's... 19 either he was older so yeah yeah well there's you know there's always that's how it goes right you hear the stories like that and everybody you know like you know young me young you we were like oh that's how you do it right we should emulate these people and, uh, I, you know, I, I, I've been mulling over, uh, I call it the Brandon Sanderson problem, right? Because uh, uh, readers will, will look at something like, they'll, they'll look at a writer like Brandon Sanderson and they'll be like, oh, that's like normal. That's like, that's like how it's done. That's what oh, you should God. do. Um, you know, you get people who are like, uh, where's the wiki for your book series? And I'm like, I <laughs> don't have one. Uh, if you want to build it, go ahead. But until yeah, that know, day. Proceed. Uh, right. But the expectation is that it exists. And I, I think the expectation too is like, oh, I'm going to write a 17 book series. Cause that's what Robert Jordan did. And like, you don't, don't do that. Right. Like you're not Robert Jordan. Don't take 20 years to do the world building, you know, 30 years to do the world building. You're not Tolkien. Like, you know, Tolkien was not trying to be a commercial author in the first place. Maybe not actually the best person to emulate. Right. 
um, you know, yeah. by by all means, write as well if you can. But like, you know, that the, like that strategy, not the best move, right? Uh, and um, you know, I I was I was in the same you know, same boat. I was planning like this big you know twelve book series at one point. It was going to be even longer than that, and I was like, this is going to be great. And then you get into publishing, and they're like, actually, like the longer the, se the series goes on, the more we hate you, uh, and um, and the more problems you cause for uh, us and the distributors and your agents and yourself and your family. And you know, let's just cut it out. Which is, of course, why I wrote a seven book series. Um, like, yeah, that's that's one of my questions. So you know, <laughs> you you sell Empire of Silence, and originally it was you know a, a, a six book series. Did you tell them at the beginning it's a six book series, and they were like? Uh, okay, we'll see how it goes. No, I was a fool. I thought it was four. Um, <laughs> and then that's not uh, too bad. I, though. They're probably thinking, yeah, four is all right. That's uh, that's manageable. Yeah, yeah. I, I just didn't want to do a trilogy because everybody does. And yeah. and the sort of the sort of meme, right, is that the middle book is uh, that's the bad the slow one. Book. Right. The slow book. The slow book. Nothing happens. I'm like, yeah, nothing. Nothing happens, right? You know, uh, you know, uh, counter. Uh, I I counter that statement with the two towers. Um, but um. You know, uh, but that, but that is that is the meme, right? And um, and so I was like, oh, I'll just I'll fix the problem. I have two middle books, genius. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, they 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 fell for it, the fools. Uh, and uh, I started outlining uh, Demon in White, and I was like, oh no, oh no, because my uh, my plan originally had been uh, that the events that are in Demon in White and Kingdoms of Death, which became Kingdoms of Death and Ashes of Man, will all be one book. So those three books were supposed to be one book. And that was a bad plan. So um, it didn't work out. So I went to them and I was like, hey, can I have one more book? Can we make it five? Like five's a five's a good number. And they were like, sure, totally, no problem. Like, you know, I had the contract like the next day and uh, didn't think anything of it. And then they uh, came back. I submitted, I think this was 2021. I submitted Kingdoms of Death and it was like a 350,000 word, you know, giant, giant novel. And, um, and they were like, cool, looks awesome. I didn't hear from my editor for like eight months, uh, you know, and then um, I get a phone call. It's like, hey, uh, the book needs to be split in half. It's too long. Uh, and you have like two weeks to do it. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. Um, oh. you know? So I fortunately, you know, uh, deadlines are inspiring, right? Uh, they can be. <laughs> that's right? one way so, for them. I want to yeah. describe them. Yeah. <laughs> fortunately, but fortunately, there was like a really like clear place to cut it, so I could turn in the first half pretty quickly, and okay. then I had a couple more months to fix the second half. So, so five books then went in my head to six, but I was thinking that the last book was going to need to be as long as that previous, you know, giant book had been. So mm. I was like, look, does this mean I need to be preemptively thinking about the last book also being split? And like, no papers were signed, but they were like, yes, right? Like, you know, like that might be that might be a good thing to think about. Um, and, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk cause, uh, my publisher recently, uh, had to sell, right. Doll was acquired by mm. this other company and they said, look, we'll talk after the merger. Uh, but yeah, like start writing, you know, assuming it's two books. And, uh, then, um, they sort of changed their mind after the merger. Uh, and they were like, it's going to be one book. Actually, I'd already written like most of book six, uh, you know, oh. so I was like that, you know, that's not going to work. Uh, which is why I, I changed publishers, but uh, the the book count kept creeping up, sort of uh, against uh, my best wishes, let's say. But you know, you know how it is, right? The story needs to serve itself, and as long as you know the the business stuff, uh, you know, can uh, can fall in line, you know, um, that's what you do. You, you know, you try to serve the story in the best way that you can uh, with the limitations that are sort of prescribed to you, and. Um, sometimes those limitations are, are bad and you have to come up with a new, a new way to solve the problem. Right. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I wanted to have finished the series a long time ago. Uh, and, uh, it, that did not work out. So, you know, we're there, um, we're, we're almost there now. I, I'm outlining book seven and that's sort of a weird feeling, right. Mm, um, to be, yeah. uh, but I've never, never finished anything. So I'll we'll have to see if I can do it. That's, um. <laughs> You know that's the real test, right? Because uh, if it's bad, then the other six are terrible. It doesn't matter. Um, so. It's yeah. I, I did two connected trilogies, so sort of uh, six books and a novella, prequel novella, and writing that sixth book with the idea of I may never come back to this world again meant that I took an extra couple of months because it just took me longer to tie up almost everything. In the case of if I never come back, it has to be satisfying enough. Um, yeah, it can be a challenge, but you got book 
six disquiet gods i saw the hardcover uh, uh announcement for the artwork in april 2024 yeah and then probably 2025 will be book seven and then that's it you're all you're all done <laughs> yeah uh yeah i you know i don't know that i'll ever leave the setting um mm. you know if i have a space opera idea why not you know save the world building energy right yeah yeah um if, if you can make it work you know that's great because you know people people love connective tissue anyway right yeah. but um but yeah the hadrian story will be done uh which is super weird right because it's it's the as i said it's the same project i've been working on since i was a kid right in some form or other and and to say goodbye will be a a very i think emotional episode and i'm usually not a very you know sentimental writer you know you get um you get the the readers who are like man is it hard for you to like kill characters and like they are not real right um <laughs> like uh they are my ideas and they serve me actually um you know i'm not i'm not one of those writers who's like oh the character is just like they're alive for me i'm like the, the, she's no longer with us i can say this but um Anne rice once said in an interview that the, the the more time it goes on, the more she hears Lestat's voice and he talks to her. And my always my, my comment was always, if you're hearing him talk to you, there's something that needs to right, that, And Rice, that's not normal. Um, <laughs> you know, like you should you should get help for that. Yeah. But, um you know, I understand the idea of if she's been writing for 20 years, writing him is clearer, his voice is clearer. If you're hearing him, that's totally different, you know? That's the catch. Yeah. You know, on the other hand, right, I because like all these novels have been from the one character's point of view, I do not know how much of that character's voice is my writing style or his, right? So moving on, I'm sort of interested to uh, to see how I, I I sort of, or can I escape Hadrian's, you know, shadow? That's, because right? written... I know you've done some like short stories and other things in Tales of the Sun. Are any of them from other people's perspectives? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. I've done three novellas. Two of them are not from his point of view. Um, right. and, and, you know, people seem to, well, the first one's out. The second one is coming out in almost next month it's almost october it'll come out in november um and uh so hopefully people will like that one too and so far it seems you know seems fine mm. uh but um you know, so you know uh much fewer people read you know your sort of independently published tie-in novellas than read the read the books right yeah so you know the uh the population that is judging those novellas is sort of selected and is not maybe as impartial slash hostile as uh, sort of a, a broader audience might be. Those are like the real dedicated folks. So, um, you know, the the test has yet to happen, I think. But um, mm. I do, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident that um, a, a lot of, that there, that there's a lot of crossover just between my style and that character's voice yeah. at this point. I, so do you I, ever find the first person perspective restrictive when writing Hadrian there? Uh, because you want to go off and somewhere else and you can't because it's always he has to see it or hear about it. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, right? There are things you can't do, right? You you can't, you can't, you can't leave his head, right? Yeah. Um, well, you, you, you can, but you have to get really clever about how you do it, right? You need to like, mm. you know, uh, there's a chapter in, in book five that's from a different character's point of view, but it's because the character is reciting the whole chapter, right? Right, okay. uh, You know, it's, you know, there are ways to do it, but um, uh, it uh, it is still limiting, right? And, and look, you know, limitations are, um, limitations are, are good, right actually from a creative standpoint because you have to then get creative um mm. you know i remember uh talking about doctor who right they uh they did away with the sonic screwdriver i think in the early 80s when peter davison took over it was just gone um and it i don't think it returned at all until the movie in the 90s it might have shown up a couple times and it mm. was because it was starting to become a magic wand that solved all of the problems right which, yeah yeah um they sort of leaned into in the new show uh in a kind of a tongue-in-cheek way that which like worked but um uh, by removing it, right, you know, you force the writers to actually think about how to solve problems um, because you can't just, you know, reverse the polarity of the neutron flow. And, um, you know, uh, and, that, and, that, and that's good. That's good for the writers to have to use their brains. Uh, and so, you know, I, um, you know, I, so yeah, like there, there are absolutely limitations to first person, but there are, you know, there are tremendous benefits too, right? Um, mm. You know, every sentence then becomes a, a, opportunity to characterize the protagonist right um if even if he's describing a tree right uh it tells you he's the sort of person who feels that that is necessary right and would need to describe the tree in his own sort of you know uh distinctive way and um and that's and that's really you know that's an opportunity but it also you have an opportunity to like hide stuff i'm a tremendous fan of gene wolf right and uh, gene wolf writes from first person uh, a lot and he uses 
not just the fact that it's first person, but the form of first person. Is it epistolary, right? Is it a memoir? Uh, what is it, right? To to impact the nature of the story. There's a really wonderful short story that he did called Trip Trap that I, I you know, I, I gush about at every opportunity. And it's it's from two point of view characters. One of them is sort of basically a Starfleet officer, and one of them is an alien who is basically a medieval knight. And together they uh, they fight a troll that lives under a bridge, right? But you get um, you get the alien and the Starfleet officers differing perspectives on what that situation is because it cuts back and forth, mm. and um, and that deepens you know the the story and the characters in really meaningful and interesting ways to be that close to a character. Yeah, um, it allows you to you know make the audience work a little bit more, but it also gives you an opportunity to put stuff in a story that you maybe couldn't have with just um you know a sort of standard third person um not that standard you know third person stories don't have you know um tremendous opportunities right there are reasons to write a story in every single way i know a lot of especially younger readers tend to not like dune for the omniscient perspective Mm. uh, because it keeps moving into people's heads but a conversation between jessica and thufir hawat uh, is very different if you are trapped in just her head or just in Thufir's head yeah. uh, than it is if you can see what they're both thinking at the same time. If you know the conversation is happening, but Thufir is playing this game and then Jessica is playing this game simultaneously, like like mm-hmm. there's an opportunity there that you don't have if you're limited to just one or the other. And so the question you know writers should ask is like, what's the appropriate um, storytelling mechanism for the story that I have in mind? I tried to do the like multiple point of view Game of Thrones kind of thing at first when I started trying to make Sun Eater work. And um, in a lot of ways, I think the like time scales and just the scope of like the whole galactic, you know, war problem is just too big um, to get through all the time that needed to be accounted yeah. for. So, um, cause when you have extra point of view characters, you expand the word count cause you have to, you know, you have to, you have to jump between people's heads and each of those characters needs to have, you know, their, their trajectory. Right. Yep. And, and so, um, by limiting myself to just the one, right. I can tell a, in a weird way, you could tell a longer story, right. Yes. Um, and, uh, and that was, I think, to the benefit of, of this story. Right. So, you know, you just, um, you know, they're all, they're all good except, you know, for first present, like, what is that about? Uh, I don't like second know. person. I can't, I can't cope with that. I'm not. Yeah. Well, no. yeah. You know, this, this... You know, I've seen it used well once. Um, I have It was not. The, it was the whole novel. Uh, it was not the whole novel. It was very, very minimally. Um, uh, the uh, <laughs> this is very silly, but the uh, the novelization of Revenge of the Sith uses second person in these little like cutaways. Oh wow! Uh, sporadically throughout the book to sort of touch base with Anakin's state of mind as he is descending towards the dark side. Mm. Um, and that was very impactful because it all culminates in his waking up as a Darth Vader and the horror of being Darth Vader. Yeah. Uh, and by imputing that on you, it, you know, it, it, it was very, it was very good, uh, you know, but I've never seen it used as well um, or well at all anywhere else. Um, yeah. You know, so I, I know yeah. with, with having Hadrian first person, did you always set out from the beginning to make sure that he was a reliable narrator? Because I know there's some very famous sci-fi and fancy novels where they say, oh, and you do this. And then because the, the method that you're having is him as an older man retelling his story in some kind of record and he's recording yeah. it to the best of his ability. But did you always want to make him reliable so that we don't suddenly get a short story later on and someone goes, well, that's not what happened at all. And that just kind of then upsets the balance or you have to go back and reread things or yeah so there's reliable and there's reliable right i think (laughs) i think readers have a a sort of um cultural assumption at this point where they encounter a first person narrator like oh this is an unreliable narrator i love that stuff uh and uh and like well no like just because it's first person doesn't mean he's a liar right like um uh so i don't know that hadrian like outright lies the way that say Severian does in Gene Wolfe's book, The New Sun. Um, Wolf, what a quoth. He's like or, so little that makes sense. There has to be lies. So y- y- right, right. He's making himself look so good that like it. Yeah, uh, I just don't believe you. Uh, it, it's it's tough though, right? Because it's it's fiction, and so in a in a certain sense, it's like, oh, well, if this is all lies, why am I reading? It? I mean, of course, it's all lies. Like none of it's real, right? <laughs> but um, yeah, within but the like, confines of the universe that you're creating. Right. If if all you're giving me is a into it, it, from this fictional universe is something that's completely untrue, right? Like, how is that any different from just giving me a fiction novel, right? So like that's a that's a thing you have to contend with. Um, 
I don't know that Hadrian is a liar in that he is maliciously, you know, misleading the reader, but I think he's a person uh, yes. who, like, does not have all of the information and doesn't have a clear picture often of who the other people in his life are, right? He gets his brother completely wrong. Um, that will be very interesting, because I know you said you've written, uh, like, a novella about Crispin, so I'm going to have to go back and read that later. A, a bit yeah. further on the story, it'd be like, this because he perceives uh, the... the his class of society of people in a certain way. And the further he goes in the story, I'm only on book two. He's already learning things like, I was kind of wrong about the people. And, and I'm thinking, how wrong was he about his own brother then? So that's interesting. But that's yeah. that's based upon his uh, his naivete, not because he's pur purposefully detracting from the truth. It's truth as he knows at that point in time. Yeah, it's it's just his sort of limited human perceptions. And this yeah. is this is one of the advantages of, of we well, can do it in third person, but this is one of the things that you can really do in 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 this sort of first person uh thing is is really like I said narrow in on the character's psychology and spend time mm. um you know just just having them be wrong about things. And because you're you're so attached to this character's perceptions, um his prejudices, his assumptions mm -hmm. that you're seeing the whole world that way, right? Yes. Um and it may be you know, that uh, just like he's wrong about, you know, not he could be wrong about everything. Right. Um, but I, I do think he's at least relating events as he, you know, perceives them to be happening. Um, you know, yeah. it's just that he doesn't um, he doesn't understand, you know, maybe other people or some events the way, you know, the way they are. Um, you know, Gene Wolfe does this a lot. Like uh, Severian does not uh, is not capable of recognizing that certain characters are robots, for example. He doesn't have a like robots are so commonplace and also like so outside of his understanding. Like he, he just thinks they're another kind of person basically. So it's like this man like moved his head weird and you know, uh, his face did not move. Um, they're like, Oh, he's doing the C3PO head tilt. Right. Like, you know, uh, of course. Um, but the characters don't know to relate that, you know, um, in, in a way that makes sense to you and me. Cause you, you like want to write the book the way that the character would be writing it, which means, you know, if, uh, you know, a, a carrot is not a long orange root vegetable, but is in fact blue, he might not mention it, right? Because uh, he assumes you know that it's blue and, and does not stop to say, actually, carrots are blue now. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, so you, and, and moments like that are really fun just to like mess with readers, right? Um, you know, uh, all the, uh, everyone in Sunny Eater uses base 12 notation. And so sometimes the math just doesn't add up um, because, you, you know, you're like, oh, uh, eight, you know, 84 is a round number. Like, no, it's not. Uh, <laughs> like, right. Uh, I thought you said there were this many floors and, and, um, you know, I, I also will not claim that I have my math correct. This is not, uh, this was a really bold move for someone who's as bad as at everything. Take his name. <laughs> um, but, um, but you could do stuff like that. And, um, and like, that's fun. And, uh, uh Hadrian's arc in, in the early part of the series is unlearning a lot of his very confident 20 year old assumptions. Mm. Um, because we all kind of have to do that. You know, you, I, I you know, we we're, most of us were that kid at 20. who was like, Oh, the world is broken because I'm not old enough yet, actually. And when I am, you know, 45, I will have fixed everything. <laughs> it's, it's the old people that are the problem. And then you get there like, Oh no, it's the problem. That's the problem. Uh, and, uh, in this case, the problem is aliens. Um, but, um, mm. you know, so. So I, I know that you're, you plan your novels and I know you start with like, you know, one page and expand it like a 10 page and then longer. And then you actually write, you write the book. So, I plan my novels too. I'm I'm fairly detailed. So do, do you still have creative surprises and tangents that make their way into the story? And because I sometimes I do, and sometimes they stay and they're good, and sometimes they end up as cul-de-sacs and I just have to cull them. But do you still get that with having planned your book so much? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I tend to think of the sort of planning process as like increasing uh, levels of resolution, yeah. right? With the finished book being like maximum resolution, right? So you know, like, like you said, I, I start, I'll write like maybe a one or two page sort of like, and then they go here and then they do this kind of summary. Right. And then I will try to break that down into, you know, a, a number of sort of critical events, right. Maybe that's 10, maybe that's 12. Right. So I will, uh, you know, if I, I know approximately how many chapters, you know, I need for a book because I know how long the uh, the chapters are on average, so I can sort of estimate because you don't want the books to be dramatically different in length because then readers get mad at you, especially mm. if they're shorter. And so if I have like, let's say 10 points uh, and uh, then I know I have like six chapters to get to the first, you know, from the first point to the second, right? Uh, you know, because then we'll end up with about 60 chapters and we're good. So I will then go build the outline 
Um, and then um, the surprises usually come in because I will have not planned thoroughly enough, right? There might be like, oh, uh, you know, you're playing a battle and you forgot, you know, it's not fantasy, but you forgot about the cavalry. Like, oh, I, I mentioned them earlier. Like, what are they doing? Uh, and then you need to go back and sort of change things. And you, uh, the creativity really comes in uh, when you have to like solve problems that you have like insufficiently planned for. Mm. Um, at least that, that seems to be the most common form uh, that I end up with. But um, sometimes you just have a really cool idea. And when I get those, I'll sit down and I'll just re-outline things. Like from where I'm at in the book, I'll, I will uh, outline if it's like a new chapter, or I'll outline the new chapter. And then I will make, you know, commensurate adjustments for like what needs to happen ahead and, and before to account for that chapter. Um, you know, and because people do think, right, that like just because you outline something that you're like a slave to the outline and, um, mm. you know, the outline should serve you, right, as the writer. Like you should still be the boss, um, you know. And so if you if you change your mind, like that's great. Um, and, I, and I do frequently. Uh, I think the battle, there's a battle at the end of Demon and White. I think I had to re-outline it three times because I, I kept like you know either having an idea or not liking the idea i just had or something right so um i'm perfectly comfortable scrapping the plan and uh you know and coming up with a new plan i i try not to come up with a new plan in a way that causes me to have to change too much of what already has been written so you know if i have a really good idea uh that would like require me to start the book over and i've written a hundred thousand words uh, I might have to find a new home for that really good idea because uh, <laughs> um, yeah. it can't move in here. Um, nope. But, um, but yeah, so. Yeah. I, I, I'm not one of these writers who plans their books. And then I've heard some people say, Oh, you know, I'd written so much now I should throw 80,000 words and then carry on. And I, I'm like, you, you have to do what? If you yeah, that's your so, books, how could so that insane. happen? I heard that, I don't know if this is true, but I heard that part of the reason that it takes George Martin so long is that because he does not plan, he like writes whole arcs of the book experimentally and sees if they gel and then throws them out. So he's written this whole like Battle of Marine situation um, over and over a few times already, um, which like, boy, that just sounds like a lot of work. Like, you know, it, it seems to work for for George, you know, he's you know, written you know, so many wonderful books but like that is that is not for me man like that is no, no. If that is true that that sounds very hard um, yeah. T time is finite and i i'm only gonna be able to write so many books before i die so yeah i'm not i'm not doing that <laughs> yeah no and i and i don't i don't make enough to you know to to cover to cover me for for the time either so you know more power to him but uh yeah that's not for me um, no way no way so with, within the the sunny t universe that you created there are extra Solarians who are humans eventually, sort of. They they were at some point originally, yeah. but then there's only one alien race out there, the Cielsin. And uh, uh, is is that right, Cielsin? Yeah. Well, there are other alien races, but they are the only other spacefaring one, uh, at right. least so far. Uh, okay. Sorry. Yes, because we, we yeah. have met some of the um, sort of servants that look after on and they're shipped out to other worlds. Sorry, they're the only kind of humanoid spacefaring. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but even actually even call them humanoids is kind of detracting because the i the i've read two books now and what struck me was most interesting about them is that when they're trying to have a negotiation with them in the second book they're so different that hadrian quickly realizes that his starting point for any conversation with them is so radically different to them that he has to unlearn everything about them um yeah and it's that thing that Stephen Hawkins said about that, you know, we keep assuming that when we go out there and we find aliens, they're going to be like us. But he says that's assuming that they have the same fundamental way of thinking that we do. And so why would they be peaceful? And and, he, and I thought about that and thought about your aliens and thought, now that makes more sense. Yeah, I the thing the thing about a lot of uh, science fiction that bothers me is exactly is exactly this assumption, right? And I think it's because so many people start as Star Trek fans, right? And they're yep. really there really aren't that many aliens in Star Trek. It's mostly just people, right, in funny hats. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the, the Klingons and the Vulcans are, they're very accessible. You can understand them, right? They're not, they're not that different from human beings. And you can, you can relate to them, right? Like, maybe they've got a few cultural quirks, right? You know, maybe, you know, Spock is only amorous, like, once every, you know, seven years or something. But um, I think that's right. Yeah, but, yeah it's uh, the Palm 5 or seven years. Yeah. I, um, I'm not a huge Star Trek guy, so if I get anything wrong, uh, you know. 
Uh, okay. But like, but like, even even Q is understandable, right? And he is this sort of eldritch. He he really is the sort of eldritch god, right? And he's mm-hmm. like, he makes sense. Like you can, you, you know, you can understand. And really, you know, the whole Q arc is that he is, uh, you know, he's he's imposing this transcendent morality on on humanity, right? So it's you know, it, it must be understandable, right? Because we need to understand it. And um, and you know, like I'm not saying that you can't do any of these things. There are aliens in sun eater um uh they come in in book three that are a lot more amenable to humanity's way of thinking uh, and, and we can get along with them uh in in a in a much more meaningful way uh but um but it should not be the case that like all extraterrestrial life uh should be you know capable of um uh even if they can speak to us of of having the same sort of uh, psychology or philosophical background it doesn't um it doesn't wash for me so some of the aliens my, i have this sort of matrix in my head where it's like uh looks human doesn't think human looks human thinks human doesn't look human thinks human and uh doesn't look human doesn't think human and i try to cover all of those mm. squares um because they should like they should all exist right um yeah. you know uh, assuming you know that we aren't some sort of weird mathematical fluke you know you would think that the whole matrix is covered and certainly for a space opera series you want the whole matrix to be covered right so um yeah so the the, the Cielsen, i thought the, the you know they're they they're sort of humanoid they're humanoid enough you could have a sword fight with them which was you know like sort of a superficial requirement right because that would be cool <laughs> uh you know and, and um but they they shouldn't think that way you know that was that was where i wanted the villain to be and um you know you uh hadrian obviously you know talked about him having to unlearn things his assumption mm-hmm is this whole war with the aliens problem hasn't been solved because, um, you know, my uh, people have no interest in it being solved because it serves them to actually be in a war, right? This is a typical, like, uh, let's say young person assumption. Um, and in reality, like, you know, there are other factors and sometimes there are irreconcilable differences, right? Mm-hmm. And um, like, uh, sometimes coexistence is not possible, right? It's not been possible in human history. Why should it be possible when the differences are even greater, right? Uh, in this case, maybe they're insoluble because, you know, can a salesman be made to understand, you know, something like reciprocity? Uh, you know, I don't, the, the answer appears to be no, um, you know? So uh, what do you do with that? And and that's, um, that puts us in like a different space than, uh, than the usual, or at least the, the, the sort of more recent, you know, trend in science fiction is like, oh, like, well, how do we, how do we get to a place where we can have a conversation about peace, right? As opposed to, you know, what if it's not possible, which in a weird way probably uh, lands me having more in common with, you know, science fiction from like a hundred years ago than, you know, mm-hmm. than now. Uh, I, I, I've often thought about uh, what I'm doing as like, as, as like sort of going back a cycle to like, you know, re-examine the questions that uh, that we were sort of playing with at the beginning of the genre, because now a lot of people are like, oh, you know, um, you know, actually, let's tell stories where humanity is invading other aliens, and then we're the bad guys because we're so bad, and uh, let's not do the reverse because that would be mean or something. Um, and um, you know, I understand that, but um, but it's interesting to to say, hold on a second, those questions that you threw away, can we like give them a more serious treatment, right? You know, I, I talk about the series, for example, being sort of an answer to Dune, which I adore, mm. uh, but uh, Frank Herbert is so cynical about heroes and he doesn't, um, he doesn't give a solution really for what to do about heroes. He's just like, aren't heroes bad? Look at them, they're so terrible. Um, his solution is like, take a bunch of spice, become a worm hybrid rule for 5,000 years <laughs> and give humanity a cellular memory of oppression so deep that they've never tolerated ever again. And that's like not an answer, right? Like, you know, there's no, there's no melange. No one can turn into a worm person and no one can live for 5,000 years. So also there's no cellular memory. So um, we need a different answer. So I, you know, I I wanted to re-examine the hero question and like fully grant, you know, Frank's criticism, like heroes are, you know, dangerous, right? They are dangerous for the people who follow them. They are dangerous for the people they fight for. Uh, They're certainly dangerous for the people they fight against. Uh, but like, what do we what do we do about that, right? And so I, I like to go back to these questions and and sort of readdress them um, and take them seriously because you know just because someone was writing you know I don't know uh, a Princess of Mars you know a hundred years ago does not mean they were stupid, right? Edgar Rice Burroughs is not stupid, mm. uh, and uh, so like, why don't we like take some of these questions seriously and and give it another crack? Yeah, so. yeah, the idea of of what what a hero is and the idea of how people perceive 
him or her is is something that interested me. I did it in my book, um, The Coward, but in the fantasy setting, the idea of Hadrian sees himself as a, as a hero when he's you know his goal is to to prevent war and pr- pr- promote peace with this alien race. But of course, there's other characters. Without spoiling anything, there's other characters in the book that see him as this very naive character who doesn't really understand what's actually going on, and they can work through him or around him or use him for their own goals um and we see that you know from his perspective as he learns as he goes on and it's just he's growing and we're starting to understand more of of the universe and the situation that he finds himself in so i I like seeing him grow over the course and fail as well because he's actually falling down sometimes which i think is important in a main character they can't always win they can't start awesome and just keep going up because that annoys me no end in any book or any well it's genre. not it's not true right and yeah. and fiction is true in a sort of transcendent sense right if you know this is why you know people have problems with uh you know uh when they have problems with i, I guess mary sue characters right now that's like a loaded term right but when you uh when people look at a character who's like perfect at everything they, it's because they know that's not true to life right yeah. and yeah. like what does true to life mean in a context with dragons and like you know sorcerers um, they, uh, you know, uh, it, it, that's a hard thing to answer, but it, it means something. You can't just like totally abandon human nature, right? Just because there are dragons in it. I always hate when people, people, uh, use that, you know, to dismiss a criticism. They're like, um, you had a problem with, uh, you know, uh, you had a problem with this character being good at math and archery, but, uh, you, uh, you didn't have a problem with the dragons that like couldn't fly because of the inverse square law. And I'm like, man, those are like two, <laughs> those are like two different problems. Uh, leave dragons alone. Uh, get out of here. Um, right. Um, yeah, that's one yeah. of those criticisms that always just bothers me. <laughs> there has to be internal consistency. If, it, if there isn't, and it doesn't make any sense, then what's the point of any of it? The world has to hang together. Magic system, science fiction system technology whatever it is there has to be rules and there has to be structure otherwise none none of it means anything so right and if you're gonna fundamentally sort of abandon how human psychology works like that's a way worse problem than like i have dragons that uh can fly despite their tiny wings right like like dragons flying i can forgive but like human beings like uh not screwing up like that's a that's a tough it's one of the reasons i don't like star trek like most everybody is like just so good at everything all the time uh, you know, I, you know, it's too utopian, um, you know, uh, and, uh, and like, I need to see people have, uh, not, not so much even have flaws, but just, just, you know, fail. Right. Well, uh, that, that goes, uh, that's a longer conversation, but that goes back to like Gene Roddenberry and his vision and all the problems that they ran into when they did the next generation. And the, the there's lots of stories that I've read and about series one and his pushback on conflict between characters and they were like what do you mean you can't have conflict between characters and then you get to ds9 where they basically kind of threw everything out and some people love it because it's the darkest and the most explosive and the most violent and the most troubled but other people are like it's not true to the vision and it goes on and on and on and i get it i get it but there's a there's a longer conversation i think to have there that once yeah, you know, the characters it, could it... fall down that was a lot better i think yeah, I um, I it's funny you you mentioned uh, you mentioned the stories and stuff because I actually had dinner with Melinda Snodgrass once. She wrote Measure of a Man. Yeah, right? I, I know a little bit of her. I've met her a couple, uh, through a couple of things through time. Yeah, a couple of times. Yeah, she's a wonderful lady, and uh, and she was a lawyer before she was you know a uh-huh. writer. And uh, and and so uh, Gene Roddenberry did not want that script to run, and it's like one of the one of the best episodes of, mm-hmm. of, of TNG, right? And uh, you know, to the extent that they use it to inspire that you know terrible first season of Picard. And, um, and it, it, he did not want it to run because he was like, there are no lawyers in the future, right? There's no crime. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and she's like, what about like contracts? What about like, you know, <laughs> like even if you don't know, but you know, there's no, there's no commerce or anything, whatever, right? Like you have to negotiate like basic essential, you know, contracts between people. Yep. Uh, and so she actually, they, they, they snuck the episode into production when he was on vacation. <laughs> uh, and at that point the money had been spent. So he was like kind of stuck, uh, <laughs> which is really awesome. <laughs> um but uh but that's you know um you have to as a writer you have to work around your limitations sometimes right um <laughs> they eventually got him to agree to kind of yeah conflict between characters and, and and some of that but yeah to begin with it was very very difficult but there again it was a restriction and they worked with it but they didn't ignore it they didn't ignore it this is a deviation what i hate most about the very new star trek is that they've forgotten where they came from and so they just ignore 
everything and start over. I'm like, well, don't call it Star Trek. Do something else. Call it whatever yeah. you want. Call it Space Force, whatever. Don't call it Star Trek. If you're going to use the framework that someone else has created, it's there for a reason. But yeah, oh man, you don't don't get me started on this, right? The degree to which the like modern sequelitis, you know, trend betrays the spirit uh, mm-hmm. and the flavor and ethos of the originals. Uh, it, it just can't be overstated. Like, uh, just basically any ongoing franchise has like completely turned into the inverse of, of like what it used to be. Uh, and it's it's very that's a whole that's a whole other conversation. It's just uh, there's that phrase you know uh, in you see in, in divorce courts, right? It's like oh well, you know the the, uh, the divorcee needs to be kept you know at a standard of living to which uh, they have become accustomed, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the fans need to be kept right up to a standard of living to which they become accustomed. And if Star Trek started out as like this big rambling manner and has become a double wide, you know, motorhome, like that is not taking care of the fans, right? Um, you know, that is, that has turned it into something other than what it is. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, you can say more right within the framework of, uh, you know, these visions, but you can't just like say, Hey, the person who like made this thing. Yeah. We're done with that guy. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna make this something else. This is mine now. Um, you know, mm-hmm. it's, uh, that, that that troubles me because you should you should just make new things new things are good we have so few of them uh particularly in in cinema right and yep. uh and so uh by all means you know even like bad new things or, or potentially bad new things i'm like cheering for uh you know like uh, like zach snyder is kind of a mixed bag creatively but i'm kind of excited about rebel moon because it's not you know mm. it's, it's not star wars and i you know i have a great you know affection for star wars but uh, I, i'm glad this isn't it right yeah. uh I, I miss the twenty million dollar films that they used to make all the time <clears throat> because yeah. they had, they took a gamble and some of them were great, some of them were terrible. I mean, there's a new I saw a trailer the day for a Nicolas Cage film, and that guy will make any sort of weird shit, you know. Yeah, oh yeah, the, sure. The, he, Nicolas Cage, that's a whole podcast by itself. Nicolas Cage's <laughs> new one is he's like a professor at a university, and he keeps turning up in people's dreams, like as oh, himself. This is, yeah, this one where he's like bald. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. And yeah. I was just like. Yeah. That's such a batshit weird, brilliant idea. That's not like it's not part of a franchise. I want to go and see that because it looks it, cool and interesting. It's a one-off well, film. It's Nick Cage, Done. right? Like, yeah, I'm all in. Um, like, you know, it's not a Star Wars thing, and it's not a thing. I'm like, I want more of that again. I want that back at the cinema. But you know. yeah, it will be. It would be so good. I just don't. I, I don't see that problem changing. You know, in a while. So this is this is where we come in, right? This is where this is where books. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, particularly, but uh, video games to a lesser extent, mm. uh, and, and and comics, uh, you know, are able to sort of fill in the gap because those are, you know, like I, I can I can write a book for free, uh, you know, I try not to, but like I can, uh, <laughs> you know, so my the production budget is, you know, um, you know, much lower, <laughs> so um, you know, we we uh, we have a lot of opportunities, uh, you know, uh, with with our medium that. Uh, we just we just don't have with with cinema anymore, which is mm. you know to our advantage. So you know, yeah, yes. Um, so, so given that we're now kind of drifting into the the <laughs> genre thing, it's my navel gazing thing that bugs me. No, oh, yeah. Gen- genre classifications, right? I'm a little worried that with all of the endless divisions within fantasy, in particular, and now it's stretching into science fiction, that it creates extreme forms of of tribalism where people won't go outside the thing that they like because it doesn't fit within their neat box. Now, I work in marketing. I worked in marketing for 25 years. I understand. But I also understand that back in the day that Robert E. Howard was writing Conan, he was best friends and pen pals with Lovecraft and, and a bunch of others. And everything under that umbrella was called fantasy. And that was it. Yep. I like I grew up reading Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman, who did the Dragonlance books, Dragons, very kind of yeah, traditional. Yeah. Then you get like the Dark Sword stuff. Then you get uh, Rose of the Prophet, Middle Eastern inspired, and then you get the Death Gate cycle, a seven book sci fi tattoo magic portal topping world sci fi spaceship fantasy. And I'm like, now I've no idea what they would classify that as, but. It yeah, well, me. they would probably they would come up with it with its own bisects, right, and shove it in its own weird corner of Amazon. And uh, you know, two weeks later, there'd be three hundred people writing uh, <laughs> copies of it in order to game the algorithm, yeah. um, which is a way to make money. Uh, I don't think very much of it um, with respect to those who you know that's how they feed their families. That's fine, um, but as art, it depresses me. 
Uh, yeah, I'm I, I'm I'm with you. I I think that the balkanization of fandom is a serious problem, and um, it, for a lot of reasons, but not least is, is it makes it impossible for us to talk to one another. Mm. Uh, the last decade, especially, has been plagued with uh, you know partisanship and factionalism, and and um and, and just increased you know nastiness. And I thought we were all the kids who were bullied on the playground at some point, and I think we all know what that feels like. And um. You know, the so there's 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 a social element to it as well. Just you know, people who, uh, you know, are let's say like diehard hard science fiction fans might sneer at space opera people in the way that like I mean this is not new, right? Like the the Trekkies and mm. the like Star Wars fans were you know were mortal enemies once upon a time. Uh, now that distinction is like virtually meaningless, right? But um, but but it's it, I feel like it's gotten worse. It's gotten more insular and and more fractionated i have a i have a friend who uh is an older gentleman um he's in his 70s maybe maybe 80 uh he's been going to world cons uh since the 70s i think his first world con was john w campbell's last one right before he died so he's been going every year since wow and um it used to be possible when he was a kid to read everything right and and so the fandom of that time which was like one community right capital f fandom uh was was able to have a sort of shared language and shared cultural sort of patrimony uh, as everybody was reading everything, everybody was talking about everything. And it was, it was easier to read anything because the, the boundaries weren't so artificially generated. Right. Mm. Uh, I call myself a science fantasy writer just so that people who were expecting, you know, exacting, you know, equational, you know, answers on space travel and things don't, you know, get disappointed because uh, it's not there because uh, math is um, math is a language I do not speak um you know but um but that's even still i feel weird doing that you know i um i only like to talk about what genre um you know sun eater is uh at that like that level of resolution really right uh mm -hmm. because anything else you start to like lose normal people too if you you know you say something like oh sun eater is an epic space opera adventure with you know notes of cyberpunk and gothic romance and blah blah you start to sound like a sommelier describing tasting notes on wine and people actually hate that they're like i do not taste shoe leather in this grape juice like uh it, it's it's so it's just so alienating and um it, it's we and uh and we waste like so much energy right like half the panels at conventions are you know trying to pin down and define what cyberpunk is which i just sort of talked about on my own channel because uh sort of in a meta way to to point out that like i, it, I i'm not sure it's a genre at all right i i think it's like a lot of the genres we talk about are like they're like moods or they are like a collection of tropes and they're not deeper than that. A genre used to be, you know, like adventure or biography or like fiction was a genre, right? Yeah, a novel yeah. is a genre because uh, it's a type of story. And now, you know, genre is this like really narrow, you know, uh, you know, issue. We, we, we have this in we have this in uh, heavy metal, too. Right. Like there are eight trillion kinds of heavy metal. And boy, if you listen to the wrong one. Uh, all of your opinions are wrong forever, yep. uh, you yep. know, and, um, and and it makes it a very unpleasant thing, I think, to be a fan um, because, you know, you step, you know, into the wrong, you know, I don't know, Discord server and you say, hey, I feel really positively uh, about, uh, I don't know, Name of the Wind, right? And you might get like, oh, yeah, that's the best book ever, right? And the, or you might run into like, oh, you like that book? Like, what's wrong with you? Or, are you stupid? Uh, <laughs> like, get out of our server. And, you know, like, Liking a book is always a valid opinion, actually, uh, even if it's a terrible book. Uh, you know, I like some real C movies. Uh, you know, I, I have watched The Beastmaster more times than uh, probably anybody should. Uh, but uh, but it, it is terrible, uh, and I love it, uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, but... Um, and it, but it's you know it, it's okay. Sorry, I'm sort of ranting. This is no, an it, issue I feel very strongly about. Yeah, me too. I, I just it's just that tribalism that bothers me. That that you know I try and introduce people to certain books and and they're like, oh, well, I like this and like that. I'm like, well, have you tried something like this? No, not really. It, it sends people down the path of reading too many books that are too similar. And for me, the idea of science fiction and fantasy is expanding the mind in reading something that's different and unknown and and i i read broadly across the genre because i want to try things that i don't normally try and find new ideas and be exposed to two new ideas in a book surely that's the point 
Yeah, we also run into this problem where like a, a particular thing will catch on and then we will suddenly have too much of it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I pick on Grimdark a lot for this reason. Uh, there's just there's just so much of it. Uh, you know, um, that's not to say that it's bad, uh, you know, or anything. I like the world is is dark. It is often grim. Right. Um, you know, I, I'm not it, 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 my books certainly are, are both dark and grim. Um, but, uh, you know, but um, but there, you know, a thing catches on. And I think this is uh, as much traditional publishing's fault as it is sort of the indie Amazon algorithms fault, mm -hmm. because uh, you see this, especially in like YA. Right. Because publishers don't know what's going to sell. Right. They'll never admit this. Right. Although uh, that guy from Penguin Random House totally did when they were on trial. Uh, they have no <laughs> idea what's going to sell. Uh, and so what they do is they like have a random success and they don't understand the success. And when they try to understand it, they often come up with the wrong reasons. And then they're like, oh, the way we make more money is by copying this 8 trillion times, right? We, mm -hmm. you know, had a bunch of like paranormal romance YA fantasies after Twilight, right? Then we yeah. had a bunch of YA dystopias with female protagonists, right? I don't know where YA is anymore. I'm pretty sure that YA is not actually for kids anymore. I think it's for the people who were reading it 15 years ago, mm. but I was at a Scott Westerfeld signing, uh, and like everyone there was like 35, but, um, uh, but the, the publishers will, they'll come up with like the, the thing that worked once and they'll just copy it indefinitely. And so we, we hit a thing like Grimdark and suddenly there are 800, you know, Grimdark books. Some of them are amazing and some of them are like, okay, you know, mm. and, and that's just one example, right? That's been like the big thing in fantasy for a while. Uh, you know, there are, uh, you know, there's, there's also, I mean, there are different threads we might pick, right? Like, uh, non-European settings, which are delightful, right? But like, you know, like publishers will pick on like one thing, like, this is the solution. This is where the money is. And they'll, they'll run that way. And, um, for people who like something that's not that they might be left out in the cold. And, um, and if you express an opinion about it, uh, the people who like this one thing will get very, uh, they'll get very angry with you. They'll also get very angry you know, with any new example of, of the form, right? If you're a diehard Grimdark fan, right, you may have seen actually too much Grimdark to have a good opinion about a new thing because you'll yeah. be judging it by the standard of 800 different books instead of on its own merits. And, um, you know, like that's not fair to the writer, right? Uh, you know, that's not fair to the book. Um, that's not fair to you as a reader either because you've like mutated, um, you know, your uh, opinion-making apparatus into this like very you know, precise single use instruments. And, um, you know, uh, you end up hating so much stuff because you've, you've seen too much. I, I, you know, there's something, I think we just, I think we produce, like, I often think we produce just too much stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, I don't know that the human brain was ever supposed to, uh, engage with a hundred different mythologies and, and like judge them by their relative merits. I just don't think that that's a very natural thing to do. Uh, and so when people are like, oh, well, this imaginary world is better than this imaginary world in this other way, but then they compare it to 800, you know, different iterations. Um, I think it, it tends to, uh, I, th I think it tends to sour people on things, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I, I also um, think that traditional publishers are constantly playing catch up. The idea. Oh, that's true too. Uh, like They're just so, so slow. Well, some of the best places where people can take a risk because if they don't need to, is they can now sell publish or indie publish, whatever you want to call it. And successes in their um, publishers will then attempt to copy and ape and take on board because they think it's a success. So th this is a fantastic thing. The SPFBO self-publishing fancy blog off that Mark Lawrence started. It was amazing. Yeah. The idea to highlight fancy books that are self-published. And it's wonderful. And loads of people have got a lot of attention, a lot of sales. And I absolutely applaud him. Whenever I see him, I say, you know, thank you for doing this. The downside is that the last six seven eight winners have all then been taken on by orbit and traditionally published which is good for the individual but they're doing it because they think oh this is popular this is what sell this is the golden ticket again and then they put that out and the, the author hopefully gets start of a, a traditional career but it isn't the next year is a totally different book that won and they think oh that's the one that's now going to make us the the golden ticket and i'm like no, it's because they did something new and different and risky and individual. And that's what they should be doing, but they're not. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. A lot of that is just because publishers. I mean, they, they they really suffer from an attention bandwidth problem because they're often smaller companies than I think readers uh, think they are. Uh, the company I work for had fewer than a dozen full time employees, right? And um, only really three people were doing 
uh, we're paying any attention to acquisitions, right? Um, and so it's hard. It's hard to have the time to find new stuff and good stuff, um, mm-hmm. even if it's being handed to you by agents, um, just because there's, you know, there's only so much time. But but the result of this is that they, they fall behind, uh, you know, on um, – they certainly fall behind indie in terms of taste making, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, they also often don't do, uh, you know, service to – the uh the indie writers who who win these contests because the way that that author became big in indie was probably uh by understanding the indie space a, a little bit too in addition to coming up with a good idea they probably uh worked really really hard not just on the books but on promoting them mm. uh and on understanding their market and stuff like that and then the publisher does not have that very um zeroed in you know um high resolution understanding of the book and its audience that the author does and yep. they and they make mistakes. I've seen I've seen this happen a few times where a very successful indie writer will get their trad deal and their trad deal will completely flop. And they come away uh, reified in their beliefs that trad publishing sucks. Mm. Um, which I mean it can, but like so can indie, right? You can put something on Amazon.com and no one can buy it. Yeah. You know? Um uh, and and it's 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 just tough. Uh and uh, I've you know, there are uh, uh, a lot of writers, uh, you know, I, I, I knew before they had their deals who I've talked to them, like, look, right. Like you're going to be, re- you're going to be really excited at all the attention you're getting from your publisher on that first book. But if it does not, you know uh, you know, make their quarterly statements, all they hope they're going to be like that attention is not coming back on book two and like, try not to get discouraged. Um, the thing is, is that you as the author are always your, your own best ally. Right. You know, mm-hmm. I, uh, you know, I mean, you know, you have, you have a YouTube channel. I have a YouTube channel. Like publishers weren't going to do that for me. Right. So nope, like I needed nope. to do that, to do that. So, um, you know, and, and, you know, you have to figure out how to get to your readers and, um, cause like neither traditional publishing nor, uh, indie is going to, you know, by itself be the solution to your, you know, wanting a career problem, right? Like you have to be the solution yourself. Um, you know, no one is coming to save you. Uh, you know, except maybe BookTube. Uh, you know, thanks, Mike, if you're here. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah, thanks, uh, Mike. Thanks, thanks. Uh, you know, but <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but but yeah, like, like that. You, know, you you can't count on something like you know, um, like like uh, you know, uh, the right the right review in the right place. You know, coming to you know get you actual book sales. It's it's so few things actually lead to hard sales, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, that it's 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 hard. Uh, it's hard to. Uh, to do anything um but i've digressed from the point uh it's all right I, yeah yeah it, it writing being a writer these days in some ways is a lot more difficult i think not just in terms of the amount that we have to do we have to be a presence we have to be a personality most of the time unless you reach a certain level you can just disappear and the work speak for itself but then there's so much more competing for people's attention these days with the advent of the internet and everything that came with it thereafter. So you have to be your own greatest cheerleader, whether you're indie or traditional. I mean, people, one thing on my channel, I do, you know, write and advice videos and people are always asking, you know, for the silver bullet, what is the thing that makes you and it makes success? I'm like, there isn't one. This is the thing. It's always down to hard work. And yeah. That, yeah. That is it. That is it. Yeah. That's, that's, that is, that is it. Right. You know, I, uh, <laughs> there was one writer we worked with uh, when I was at when I was at Bain who was always sort of I always thought of him as like an alchemist. He was always looking for the philosopher's stone. You know, mm-hmm. I was going to just print gold for him, and um, and he was you know trying to understand exactly how we did everything so that he could like game the system, right? And uh, like you don't you don't understand uh, like there there isn't one, right? The 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 uh, the magic ingredient is you actually, and if you're not the magic ingredient, right? Uh, you know, God help you, right? Like you. You have to, as you say, be your be your own biggest cheerleader. It's really because no one else is going to do it, right? Not even your publisher, right? When they have all the financial reason in the world to help support you, uh, you know they aren't necessarily going to do it. So, um, you know, you've got to you got to do it yourself, right? Yeah, and and this is what I'm here to do as well. Talk about it. so we we kind of strayed, but I think we'll kind of wrap up there. But yeah, so book one to five of the Sun Eater series is out now. Six will be out in April. 2024 yep. next i think 2024 it's next i don't keep saying that it's next year <laughs> the years just sound like science fiction dates at this point they're like none of them are real right? it's just it's crazy yes and you're busy yeah. working on book seven but yes really big fan of the books i can't wait to get stuck in the demon and white and uh and, and pace myself 
now through the rest of the series. So I'm not one of those fans screaming for book seven the minute <laughs> after book six comes out, you know. Oh man, yeah. Well, I, you know, that's like you said. You have to compete with you have to compete with TikTok videos, and those come out way faster than I can write a book, right? Or anyone can. Yeah, yeah. We we we're, um, we're not doing those. I'm not, I'm not going on TikTok, <laughs> despite no, a neither. few requests. You will not see me on TikTok unless indirectly, but I will not be on there. Yeah, anyway, that is uh, as far from home as I can go. Yeah, <laughs> same. I'm just the wrong <laughs> age and probably gender too. But anyway, <laughs> thank you for joining me, and thanks for talking about it. I'll put lots of links down below where people can find you. And all of your books, and uh, yeah, and, and yeah, and yeah. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's been it's been a blast, and uh, <laughs> you know, it's nice to get to talk to you. So. All right, good night, everyone. Good night. Yeah, night.